What up? 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 Hey, good people. It's Thursday. It's Pastor DJ. It's 1 p.m. It's the House of Ruby channel. It can only mean one thing. What up? A time in the week where I get to share with you what the Lord is saying in this season. Get to share with you a quick word while you're doing your work, while you're doing your school, while you're in a taxi, in a car, while you're home chilling, while you're just taking a break from the busy day, while you're having your lunch. It's a time to connect with the word of God. Make it a habit. So one of the things my husband and I do is we talk a lot during the day because it doesn't make sense for us to just talk in the morning and then when I get back home because he's my husband. You know what I mean? So if that if I do that for a human being, how much more for the God who created you and I? So I would like to encourage you to put time in your daily routine where you speak to God as you go about your day because if you're in employment for example you probably have time set in your day when you catch up with your boss having a stand-up meeting having a, a squad meeting or having a scrum whatever you call it in your organization where you speak to your line manager now if you can do that for human beings how much more for your father our heavenly father so i'd like to encourage you every day don't don't just speak to god in the morning and before you sleep or before you eat but put a routine around your life. Put a routine around your faith. Your faith shouldn't be around your routine. Your routine should be around your faith. That's tweetable. Your faith shouldn't be around your routine. Your routine should be around your faith. Because at the end of the day, in him, we live, we move, and we have our being, the Bible says. So if you know that this is a person in whom you have your being, then you invest all of your energy in there so if you've not yet liked the the youtube channel if you've not yet liked this post now is a good time for you to click like share the link click click subscribe and go ahead and hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified whenever we go live we're live every thursday at 1 p.m and like i've said you need to get a routine where you listen to the word of god you can see it i'm only here for one, one once a week one day in a week but there are many episodes from the past, so if you're the kind who wants to catch up, I have enough episodes to take you for months and months and months. So you can go ahead and plan your day and watch every day as you wait for Thursday. I'm excited for what God is doing. I was just reflecting today that we actually have three months to the end of 2023. What a blessing. It's scary, but it's exciting because the Bible tells me that my latter days will be greater than my former days. So... I look with anticipation and excitement for the next three months of the year because I'm like, okay, if this has happened, then what is going to happen? Because God is going to take us from glory to glory to glory and even more glory because that's the kind of God that he is. It takes you better and better and better. The path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter unto a perfect day. So welcome once again to What Up? Time to share with you. Let me get straight into the word um i've been sharing a word about what god has been speaking to me in season and last week should i say by the grace of god i wasn't able to finish we were spending time in the book of daniel and i wasn't able to finish the message that i was trying to put across so we sort of are doing a two-part series but in the coming weeks god has placed on my heart a very 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 exciting series especially for those who are in employment especially for those who are you know running careers this series can change your life this series that is coming up is going to change your life like a hundred percent guaranteed as usual we want to take some some time off to pray and, and and thank god for the opportunity to share in his word the bible tells us that the entrance of his word brings light. It also tells us that we rejoice at his word as one who has found great treasure. It also tells us that I have desired your word more than necessary food. But this book and what I'm saying, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, they're just words. They're just things uttered. So it's important to always welcome the Holy Spirit in this space because he, he's our teacher, he's our, he's our comforter, he's our truth teller. And he brings to remembrance these things. He helps us understand the things of now and the things to come so we always pray in the beginning to welcome the holy spirit not because he's not there because he's here but why we pray is to recognize his presence i've said it before and i will say it for countless times when you're in a house in a room with somebody them being there does not mean that you've acknowledged that they're there 
when you're growing up and you have children in the house, one of the things we always teach the children to do is when they're passing us, you tell them things like, you don't greet, you've not seen me, how can you not greet me? It's rude, it is see. Why we do that is for them to learn to recognize that there is actually somebody in that space. So when we take time off to pray and welcome the Holy Spirit, it's because we are actually recognizing that his presence is here. Because if I come to your home and you just look at me, I won't feel welcome. But if I come to your home, which I will very soon, haha, you need to, to recognize that I've come. So you're like, you're welcome, have a seat. It is just why we pray. So let's take some time and pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your understanding. We thank you that our ears are open, our hearts are open, and our minds are alert. We will not miss what you're saying in this season. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Now, last week, just to give you a recap, the sermon title, you can go and watch it, was Do Not Be Small. Do not allow to stay small. And this is something God has been speaking to me for a while, particularly with two statements. He's asked me constantly, Ruby, what would happen if you actually prayed? We can talk all we want about prayer. Oh, yeah, I pray. I'm a prayer warrior. I'm a prayer person. I'm a prayerful person. Etc. 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 But what will happen if you actually pray? The Bible speaks of Jesus praying the whole night. It said he always, you know, secluded himself and went to a quiet place to pray, as was his routine. The disciples spent 10 days in the upper room waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. So there is a deeper place of prayer that you and I have not yet reached. Are we where we used to be before? No. But we are in a much better place. But are we where we want to be? No. Because prayer, the Bible tells us that deep calls unto deep. So God is constantly asking me, what would happen if you actually prayed? Forget about this praying of, I'm going to pray for one hour, which is good because that's bare minimum. Every Christian should be praying at least for one hour. But real deep prayer where you are communing with God, that kind of prayer is beyond asking for things. It is, it is a place of communing and having int intimacy with God. And one of the things I shared last week is the place of intimacy is very private. It's not... You don't conceive in public, you conceive in private. And it's a place where relationships are sealed. So, God is always asking me, what will happen if you actually prayed? If you actually were deliberate about intimacy with God? Like, just imagine the possibilities of if you actually had a life of prayer. It's a challenge to myself as well. The second thing God has been speaking to me about is, when the Bible tells us that God makes your name great, what does that look like? The same Bible comes and tells me that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ever ask or think or imagine. The same Bible comes and tells me that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, neither has it been put into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him, but has been revealed to us through his spirit. So when you put all these thoughts together, what does it mean that your name has been made great. What exactly does it mean? So those are thoughts that disturb my head because what you think is greatness is actually just a glimpse of what God is able to do to your life. And that's what we were speaking about last week. We said the first step of not allowing to live a small life, don't allow to live a small life, don't allow to live an unlived life, my pastor likes to say. Don't allow to just pass through this world. Not allowed to just be average. Yeah, you went to school, graduated, got a wife, two kids, a dog, live in a fenced house, and that's it. Like, then what? All these things are good things. But there is a life that is better than that. There is a life that is higher than that. Revelation says, come up hither. There is a life where you have to come up and see things from God's perspective. When the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I'll answer. And I'll tell you deep and unsearchable things you know not of. What are these deep and unsearchable things? Because the Bible also tells me in Psalms that the secret of the Lord is with those who love him. So what is the secret of the Lord? God is not a small boy. So obviously when he's dealing with you, he's not planning small things with you. So those are the two questions that have been in my mind. And last week when I was speaking about do not be small, my biggest message to you was the number way to not be small is by knowing your God. In Daniel 11, chapter, in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, it says, The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. So today we're going to focus on the great exploits bit. But just to give you a recap, 
for you to be able to know great exploits, you need to know your God. Because if you do not know your God, then you cannot do the great exploits. If you do not know that you have electricity in your house, then you will not switch on the light because you do not know. If you do not know that you have food in the fridge, then you will not cook it. Likewise, if you do not know your God, if you do not know, it's just a, there's, a, there's an illustration I like to give people. I say the richest man in the world currently, carnally, at the time as I'm recording this, I think is Elon Musk. I'm coming also. So, and so are you. So Elon Musk, richest carnally, according to the standard of the world, is the richest man. So if Elon Musk had an illegitimate child, maybe, and the child has go, is in like Botswana or here in Uganda in like Karamoja. If that child does not know that he or she is Elon Musk's son or daughter, the way they live will be different. They'll probably be living a poor life, a small life, a basic life, you know, just here and there because they don't know who their father is. The moment they find out that their dad is Elon Musk, it changes everything completely. And that is the same thing that is with Christians. Many of us do not know our God. If we really knew who God was, we would not be living small, average, basic lives. We would be desiring more. We would be poured out. We would be selfless. We would be, would be different because we have known who our father is. In Proverbs it says, a good father leaves an inher- a good man rather leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So now that's, that's just a good man. But God comes and tells me that you and I are co-heirs with Christ. Christ for whom, through whom, and in whom all things were created. And he has placed everything under his feet. That is the person who you are co-heirs with. So sometimes we have it as head knowledge. But it takes a lot of time for it to be heart knowledge. Because we need to move from a point where our Bibles are here to them entering our minds, our hearts, and then part of our lives. We need to move to a point where you manifest what the Bible says. And it takes takes time, it takes intimacy with God, it takes deliberate, because the Bible says that he who comes to him must believe that he exists and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I think that the more you seek God diligently, his reward to you is his word being made manifest in his, in your life. People start to see there is the word of God passing. There is the word of God passing. Because your life is evident of who the word of God is. So, for you not to be able to stay small, you need to be, you need to know who your God is. Because if, you, if God is just a theory in your mind, if God is just someone you meet on Sundays, then you're definitely going to have a small life. But God is calling you to bigger. Bigger, 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 bigger. Moses Bliss has a song that says, I'm getting bigger every day. Because... The things of God grow. You don't remain the same. One of the things God has revealed to me recently is about the story of Joseph. When Joseph was sold to Egypt and he became king, he became ruler of all Pharaoh's household. His brothers came to him and did not recognize him. Imagine they came, went back, came back a second time before he could tell them who he was. And they did not recognize him. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, It says that he met two people and he walked with them a long while and they did not recognize who he was. And he was conversing with them. They were even asking him, haven't you heard what has happened? This man, etc, etc, etc. And then he opened their eyes and then they recognized him. What God revealed to me about that is when you grow and change, the people who stay the same will not recognize you because there's a certain glory that comes on your life. But for you, you're able to recognize them because they have remained the same. So you knew exactly what they looked like. But for you, because you have changed, They can't recognize you. And that's the thing with God. God is always taking you to different levels. Who you are today in God should not be who you are tomorrow. Because you move from being a babe, baby, becoming mature. Paul writes and says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. But now that I've grown up, I have put childish things away from me. So there's always growth in God. So the first step to not staying small is you have to know who your God is. It's not just head knowledge. It's not just a thing of, hey, what, what? I know my God. It's in being deliberate in actually knowing God, knowing who he is, knowing his ways, knowing his principles, and most importantly, knowing his love for you. One of the things that will happen automatically when you know God, the Bible tells me that 
you will be strong and you'll carry out great exploits. Let me read it for you. It says, but the people, but the people, meaning not everyone will know, will know, will know their God. The people who know their God shall be strong. We live in a world where one of the things that you should never lose is your strength. And strength also comes from joy, which is a whole different sermon altogether. The Bible tells us that the joy of the Lord is your strength. It says you shall be strong. When people lose people, on top of saying, sorry, my apologies, may God comfort you. When someone is going through mourning or sadness, they will always tell the person, be strong. When a lady is going to be birth, give birth a child, be strong. When someone is going to go through some sort of tough time, they'll tell them, be strong. When someone is going to go into a fight, they tell a person, be strong. Because there is power in strength. The Lord is your strength. So the Bible is telling me that if you know your God, you will be strong. It does not say you will be happy, you will be blessed, you will be rewarded, you will be prosperous. All these things are true. But you will be strong. Because when you're strong, the Bible says, after you have done everything to stand, stand. Stand therefore. Because God knows this, the importance in strength. So they will be strong. But I'm not going to focus there today. And says that you will carry out great exploits. Part of not living a small life, child of God, is carrying out great exploits. But what are these great exploits? I've come to realize that greatness in God, greatness for God, most times has nothing to do with you. Most times has nothing to do with your own benefit or your own um, satisfaction, your own gratification, your own, um, you know, feeling nice about yourself. The great exploits begin when you decide to live above self. I'll take you to a little verse here. It's in Philippians. Today I'm reading from the NIV. So Paul writes to the Philippians. Let me get it for you very, very quickly here. In Philippians chapter 2. And he writes to them and says, in chapter 2 verse 3, he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or in vain, in vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look to own your own interests, but also to the interests of others. The moment your vision turns from yourself and you start focusing on others, then you start to live the great exploits. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit doesn't live in the air. But the great exploits are actually done by the Holy Spirit. But he needs a body through which to carry out the great exploits. Now, when you truly, truly, truly yield to the Holy Spirit, your attention is driven towards others. The Bible says that your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Christ was always looking for others to help, to bless, to heal, to elevate, to promote. Very few times in the Bible do you find that Christ was just seated there doing nothing. In fact, the only time he was resting is when he met the woman at the well and said, I was thirsty, give me a drink of water. That's the only time you, you see that Christ is like in a place of rest. Yet even in his place of rest, he was still helping other people. The great exploits begin when you look at the outside, then you look in. You look, you look into yourself and then you look outside. Because God created, actually the first story of creation shows you how much God was thinking about other people instead of himself. Because he created everything else for man. He created man last because his main focus was let me put things that man needs to be comfortable and then he put him there. So your great exploits begin when you recognize that the talent God has given you, you're a worshiper, you're an artist, you draw, you're a good chef, you're a good teacher, you're good with kids, you're a good soccer player, whatever, whatever. It's not for you. It's for the world. It's for the people in the world. It's for that lady in the neighborhood. Your skill, let's say for you, the people come and tell me, oh, for me, I don't have a talent, blah, blah, blah. Everybody is talented in one way or the other. However, beyond talent, it's the discipline to grow that talent that makes people successful. Most times gifted people struggle because they know they are gifted, so they never practice and do all these things, which, yeah. So the giftings and the talents of God, which are the giftings of God, which are without repentance, he has given you for other people. 
He has given people. And that's how you do the great exploits. If you decide to put everything about you with the focus on other people. We live in a world now that is fallen. Everyone's like, oh, self-care, me first, or oh, my opinion, my truth. All oh, that's complete nonsense because that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says you should not look to your own interests. Each of you should not look, sorry, each of you should not only, should not, should look not only to your own interests. Meaning it's okay to look to your interests once in a while. I'm not saying go and go and, and not eat and live a bad life and suffer. No but also to the interest of others. Do not out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. If we all adopt that kind of attitude, the world will be a better place. One of the things I, I shared in one of my recent teachings is that God is generational. God is generational. When you do these things, you're actually impacting a generation. If you want to impact a generation, you need to think beyond yourself and think about the other people. No one that says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Because if you're thinking in, in, in terms of, of, of being selfish, of course you'll not be thinking about his children, let alone his children's children. And a good man is one who does great exploits. No one that says a good man, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Who is a good man? One who lives beyond self, who performs great exploits. So many times when you come and ask people, oh, or if I asked you, what is a great exploit? Because innately we are selfish, your great exploit be like, oh, I'll be like a big businessman. I'll be like a big boss in a company. I'll be like, uh, you know, somebody who's so big. But all those are selfish ambitions. I was reading a, a text recently about uh, what they do in China. So there's a game we play, like to play here in Uganda called dancing musical chairs. So they put the dancing musical chairs and then you dance. Then the music stops, they pull out one chair. So everyone who's not seated goes. So the game, you know, they keep producing a chair, a chair, a chair until you have one chair and everybody is fighting for a chair to sit on. But in China, is it Japan or China? One of the two. Or Korea. China, Japan or Korea, one of those. What they do is they play dancing musical chairs with a twist. What they do is they tell them that when the music stops, make sure everyone is seated no one should be without a chair so the whole game people are trying to make sure that at least everyone has a seat so everyone is pulling everyone to make sure that they are seated until the last chair is removed so they have flipped it we, we, have, we have we have moved from a point of being you know selfish and what i need to get a chair for myself for them they are saying no everybody should come together we need to move away from the place where when you leave, leave a, 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 a when you leave an employer and moved to another job and then they say, oh, I failed to replace that person. There's none like you. No, we need to get to the point where we are teaching people, sharing our skills. That's how you do great exploits. There's no such thing as you're irreplaceable. You need to be able to be replaced. And how do you do this? Because you have trained people to be exact, to do what you can do and even better. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus said, greater works than these will you do. So if Jesus wants you to do greater, you should want that other people and that's really a message for employers and employees so i want to encourage you as you go into this last half of the year last not half rather last quarter do great exploits know your god there is no way you can know your god and be selfish if you're constantly in the word constantly going to church constantly sending summons listen prophet this apostle this evangelist this and you remain selfish then your wood is wet the problem is not the word. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you to see what the missing link is because God wants people who live open-handed. One of the ways you live open-handed is by opening up your heart, your resources, your money, your home, your, your life to other people. And once you do that, then you have started to do great exploits. One of the people who lived the greatest exploit on this earth was Jesus Christ. He came in Philippians, it says, Him who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and for, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. God in all his power to come as a human being was a very humble thing to do. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The greatest exploit Christ ever did was coming 
and dying on the cross for you and for me that we may have life and life in its fullness. You can't have a great exploit without receiving the one who had the greatest exploit, the greatest exploit, who is Jesus Christ. So I want to give you an opportunity. If you've never given your life to Christ, you don't know about this Jesus. You just hear, or you've never even heard of him. It's very simple. All you have to do is put your hand on your chest and repeat these words after me. You say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Today, I give you my life. Take it and do something significant with it and help me achieve the great exploits. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So if you've said that prayer, you're born again. I don't have enough time now to explain to you what it means to be born again. But there's a number on your screen and an email address. Send a text, send an email and say I got born again while watching what up. There is a pastor on the other end of the line who will walk this journey with you. Place you in loving family and help you understand what it means. Help you understand that you've actually just moved from death to life. And you've started the journey of moving on to great exploits. To the rest of you, thank you so much for joining us on what up. Share this link with friends, with family. The next series that is coming up is for people who are in employment particularly. So if you know your boss, your line manager, your employees, just gather them and share this information with them because God has placed a word on my heart, particularly for people in the career space, in the workspace. And I'm sure that it's going to change, your, change their lives. You're blessed, you're elevated, you're healed. Disease doesn't come near you, not malaria, not flu, not bacterial infections. Your kids are blessed. To a mother here, stop calling those things children diseases. Some of you are saying, oh, my kids go back to school, they're going to come back with these children diseases. No, they will not. Because you're a child of God and sickness doesn't dwell in your midst. You receive fees, you receive tuition, you receive wisdom on how to raise your children. For those of you are expecting you will carry full term because that is God's desire for you. Get planted, get rooted in a church, someone, so that you will be blessed like a tree by the riverside whose leaves do not wither. But in everything you do, you will prosper. Once again, my name is Pastor DJ. See you next week on Thursday on the House of Ruby channel at 1 p.m. for Bye.